Hi, good evening. So today let's start a new branch of knowledge. We begin this book named High Dimensional Statistics, written by Martin Wainwright. So today let's read Chapter One Introduction. This introduction gives you several examples of what the non-asymptotic viewpoint is, and it gives you an overview of what this book will cover. And I guess we should read the first five chapters of this book because we don't have so much time to do so. Anyway, let's first start chapter one. It's a brief introduction. The first part is the classical versus high dimensional theory. So let's see. So this sentence is important that we want to consider the high dimensional flavor, which means the dimension of data D is on the same order as or possibly larger than the sample size n. So when the sample size n becomes large, we also expect that the dimension d will also become large. So this is the most important thing we want to consider. So I also make a brief markdown. So the motivation is that the dimension d is on the same order or possibly larger than the sample size n. So what's the disaster? The disaster is that the classical large n fixed d theory fails to provide us with useful predictions. And sometimes the classical methods can just break down dramatically. So the second part is about the potential disasters in high dimension settings. So the author gives about three examples. The first example is about the linear discriminant analysis, which we've already start studied in multivariate statistics course. And here we consider a natural decision rule based on this log likelihood ratio. And if you learn the hypothesis test, it's just like, you know, the likelihood ratio test. So you can expect that in the, you know, when n comes large, this log likelihood ratio will tend to the distribution of chi-square distribution. So that's the background knowledge. As this is about linear discriminant analysis, we wanna, you know, tell about tell apart two types of distributions here. Say P1 versus P2. We wanna say if data is from these two separate distributions or P1 and P2 are just the same. So as for linear di discriminant analysis, we build this linear statistics based on the log likelihood ratio named psi x equals to this linear statistic. And we want to compute the probability of incorrect classification. So this is the method of classification, so we want to compute the probability of incorrect classification like this. If we assume that the two classes are equally like, so here we write 1 over 2, which means the two classes are equally like. And here, since we want to consider if the sample x prime, and we calculate the linear statistic is less than zero or the psi x2 prime this calculation is larger than zero we wanna you know we choose the threshold like zero and here we give the two parts the same 
you know, same weights to combine this as the probability of incorrect classification. So here, the book says that x prime and x two prime are all random vectors drawn from the two distributions, say p one and p two respectively. And by some easy calculation, we get the you know the probability looks like this. It's just phi negative gamma over two. But generally, in practice, we do not get the true value of mu and sigma. So we have to use the data from sample to estimate the covariate matrix and the mean vectors like this. This is trivial, so we get the Fisher linear discriminant function like this. Here we we are assuming that. N i must be larger than d because here we have the matrix and we want to get the inverse of this matrix and the sample covariance is invertible. To make sure about this, we have to implicitly assume that N i must be larger than d. And here is the arrow of psi hat, the psi hat. If we analyze the simple version like this, where the covariance matrix is known as the priori to be the identity, we can get the linear statistic like this, where the term of the hat of sigma inverse just disappear. So we get this equation 1.5. Based on some calculation, we get that the error converges in probability to this. Looks that the equation 1.6 looks different from that of equation 1.2. Equation 1.2 here inside the big five, there's only a term of Gamma, but now we also consider an alpha, where alpha means what's the definition of alpha? Let me see. Here it says that we consider the high dimensional setting. In this setting, the ratio d over n i. Converges to some non-negative fraction alpha. So here alpha is the non-negative fraction means that the ratio of d over n i all converges to the same fraction alpha like this. So here is the difference between the high-dimensional settings and the classical theory that predicts. So we want to find out if we should use. Equation 1.6 or equation 1.2 to get some, you know, some correct predictions. So now, the author gave some illustration of two settings. Here, the picture A shows the error probability versus the mean shift parameter gamma. Let me see. What's the mean shift? What's the gamma means? So gamma has the definition of gamma. Looks like m distance. Ma shi jili m distance. And let me see. So if you use the high-dimensional theory, it will, you know, it looks correct because the empirical results also locate on this line. But if you use the classical theory, 
when considering the mean shift or the fraction. It fails to predict what the empirical results is. So this example gives you the insights on what the high dimensional theory looks like. So we have to consider many things when the ratio of d over n i converges to non-zero. Now, strictly positive number, which means when the sample size comes to infinity, the dimension of data also converges and uh, also becomes large. So another thing to mention is that a failure to take into account the high dimensional effects will lead to suboptimality. Here is an example, but d over n i converges to different values of alpha i. But before, we only consider one quantity alpha. Here we have two quantities, alpha 1 and alpha 2. And we consider the general choice of threshold t. So here we write t, but not 0. And we can show that the error convergence in probability to this. So to make the results optimal, we have to wait better choose the threshold value t as 2 over alpha 2 minus alpha 1, so that this term goes to 0 and we can, you know, guess the optimal value. But if we just ignore the high dimensional settings, we use the classical results, we will get a failure to, you know, to get the optimal solution. We only get suboptimal solution. So this is example one. The second example is about the estimation of covariance. So you may think like, well, the sample covariance matrix is this. So what do you expect it to be when in the, you know, the high dimensional settings? So here's an example we want to, let me see. First of all, regardless of which norm is used, the estimation, the sample covariance, this estimation is consistent. So we use this matrix norm and we can prove that this difference of these two matrix convergence to zero on surely as n tends to infinity and it's a strongly consistent estimate of population covariance. But is this type of consistency preserved if we also allow that the dimension d tends to infinity. If d is fixed, of course, it's generally consistent. But if we also allow that dimension d comes to infinity, like this, we let the d over n equal to the fixed number alpha, which is strictly positive and less than zero. In this example, we just consider the ground truth. The population covariance matrix is the indicator identical matrix ID. It's a diagonal matrix. And we assume that each XI is drawn from this normal sample, normal population. And we also arrange these eigenvalues like this. This result. So, what I think in this picture, this picture shows the histogram of eigenvalue. This density is, you know, the time, the times that each eigenvalue appears in the set. You know, there are so many eigenvalues when n and d comes to uh, uh, tend to. Infinity store, we 
we get so many eggs values and we went different eggs values and close the histogram of the different eggs values and we get this histogram so here I write the note like here we get D eigen values and the D is also high dimension so we plot the histogram of this D eigen values since D comes to infinity so we can get this empirical results also we have the theory we have the theoretical result like this here's the theory the distribution here is the MP law based on MP law we can get the asymptotic distribution on this interval with T mean and T max so if you are given different value of alpha when alpha is small we get this range from about 0 0.3 to 2.2 .2. But if alpha goes large, here the minimum value is about 0 0.15 and the large value tends to 2.9. So this is the theory of the asymptotic. Uh, asymptotic results when both D and N tends to infinity. And based on the knowledge of chapter 6, but I guess we will not cover this chapter. We can get these results. The upper deviation inequality like this. Which combines the consideration of D tends to infinity. And the third example, also the last example, is about non-parametric regression. The basic idea of non-parametric regression is to estimate a function from this unit hypercube to the real line alpha. It's just like the machine learning setting, the unsupervised setting. When you are given some sample of x over y, we want to use the sample x to predict y, to get the predicted function. And we use this this square prediction error like this and theoretically the optimal solution is a conditional expectation like this fx equals to the conditional expectation of y given x this is also the so-called regression function but in practice the joint distribution of x and y is unknown so we have to estimate the function f hat and we use the MSE setting like this to measure to justify if the you know estimation f hat is optimal. So this is an estimation of the mean squared error. We want uh, the MSE to be small as small as possible. To find out what would happen, we consider this uh, this simple example like we consider that the covariate vector x is uniformly distributed over this this uh, unit box unit box. So it's a uniform distribution like this. And here the is the criteria which is somewhat strange, some, somewhat, you know. It's li less likely for you to see this criteria. It says that if the estimation f hat is good, then since f hat is estimated based on samples f1 to fn, and we also consider that another vector, a typical vector, this is also an independent, another vector different from x1 to xn. We, you know, get another sample from the distribution. 
and then we consider that this x prime should be relatively close to at least one of our samples. At least one of our samples. So this is the consideration. So the criteria is the row in D, which equals to that the minimum of the difference of x prime and x i, but we use the infinity norm. Why we use the infinity norm? We want to, first of all, we want to consider that the largest value of x prime minus x i, which reflects the, you know, somewhat the distance yeah, the distance of x prime and x i, and we get n of this distance. So we want to consider the minimum norm value, which reflects if the you know the distance of this typical value x prime is close to at least. So at least is the minimum here at least one of our samples from x1 to xn and the question is we want to consider what what sample size is needed to you know to make sure that this error is less than some threshold delta we want to ensure that this row falls below some threshold so here's an example of two settings like n equals to 2d and n equals to d square. But you can see that the error uh, increase all the time and it could be easily you know larger than the given delta as let me say 1 over 3. So when d when n is linear of d or the quadratic form of d, the theory fails. So I consider that the n the sample size must be exponentially large over the di data dimensional d data dimension d. So here, in fact, we need to take exponentially large sample size, and we can prove. The author leaves this equation to exercise, and I also proved it, but not complete. So if you have some advice on how to prove this equation, you could feel free to contact me. And the result is that n must be larger than this, so that the upper bound holds. So here, since there is a log, so we need to take exponentially large sample size and uh, this content is somewhat a digression that gives you the motivation of delta covering or let, let me say packing so we will talk about packing and covering theory in chapter 5 so here gives you the intuition so if we fix this different xi if this is not random but we fix this here it says that you are given the freedom of choosing the collection of xi and the most straightforward way is to consider the uniform grid data so we we how to say we build several unit hypercubes so we you know we we build this we build this much boxes so that when you are given an arbitrary x prime the x prime must be located in one of these boxes so the difference of x prime and xi must be less than delta. You also find out that this is also exponentially large in dimension, and this is the so-called 
Delta Cavalry. So this is the all contents of chapter 1.2. And section 1.3, let me see. It gives you several potential benefits in high dimension. They are sparsity in vectors, structure in covariance estimation, and structure forms of regression. But we will not discuss these contents now, and we will discuss these contents when we study later in different chapters, say chapter 5, chapter 15, and other chapters. So here we just list several potential benefits in high dimension settings. And finally, another knowledge is the non-asymptotic viewpoints. So you may have a question like, what is the non-asymptotic viewpoint? What's the asymptotic viewpoint? And what's the classical viewpoint? So here, in section 1.4, the author just made a summary here. So what is the non-asymptotic viewpoint? The classical asymptotic is that the dimension T is fixed and is typically, you know, a small value. And we made the sample size N taken to infinity. This is the classical asymptotic. Here, other problem parameters remain fixed. And in the settings of high dimensional asymptotics, what's the asymptotics? We gave some, you know, we consider some scaling function psi, and the sequence psi remains fixed or converges to some value. So this is somewhat, you know, restricted solution since we have to make that psi n d behaves in a fixed manner or it has some, you know, converse value, so this is somewhat restricted. So this leads to the talk about non-asymptotic bounds. Non-asymptotic means you should consider all, con all conditions of N and D. So we may have high probability statements, high dimension, yeah, high probability, also high dimensional, the uh, high dimensional statements that we have to consider the function of n and d. Is that the result is also the function of n and d? We consider all different manners of n and d when it comes to large in n of the linear setting of d or the corrective form, exponential form, log form every form. So the result is made as a function of n and d. But in high dimensional asymptotics, there is no fixed manner. The sequence per side remains fixed or converts to some fixed value. But in non-asymptotic bound, it will become no, you know the result is the function of n and d. So this all about chapter one. It gives you an introduction, an introduction of what the non-asymptotic viewpoint is, and it also gives you three examples of disasters. So what we should consider to mitigate the problem that the high dimension settings gives you. So this is what this book talks about, and that's all. Content goodbye.